Hello Brighton. Um, so happy to be here and talk about colour because exactly uh, as it's been said, it's my favourite subject. Now, I hope I get this right. Yes. So first of all, what is colour for? Because it's not just to make things pretty. It's not just because it's beautiful. Colour really helps us in everyday life because it indicates function. Like, for instance, when we go to the supermarket, we're able to identify berries and fruits immediately because of the colour. Also, when we, our ancestors were out in the field foraging, it was extremely useful to be able to identify poisonous uh, fruit from edible ones. So, very useful. Also, of course, we can build complex navigational systems thanks to colour. Our London Underground map is a very important case in hand because we immediately identify lines by colour. Although, it's not always a good thing to rely solely on colour, as we'll soon see. But in this case, we also see position, shape, well, there's, there's other things that are helping us as well as name. So colour also in nature provides a warning. You can scream out, don't eat me, uh, or make love to me, or don't you dare touch me because you will die, even though I look very beautiful. So keep off. So, and also, uh, in the case of uh, traffic lights, I Please correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as I know, I think this is a case where it's a completely globally, this mean, these colours mean the same thing. Red is stop in your tracks straight away. Amber is you may begin to start moving with caution, and green is all systems are going. As far as I know, this is the one case where colour is, uh, means the same internationally everywhere on a, on a global level. So, because Colour is different also depending on, on cultural, historical and local uh, factors. So colour helps us navigate life as well as the web. And however, please let me utter this total platitude, which is that colour is different in real life and on the web, uh, which sounds obvious, but it needs to be talked about. So first of all, colour lives in light, and this is true in both cases, both on the web and in real life, but things are very different. Because even though it might seem obvious to us these days that colour is light, because we're web professionals that, and we work with monitors, and we know that colour on our monitors is made with light, the first to associate uh, colour and light was Isaac Newton in the 1660s, when he was carrying out experiments on optics, not on colour, it was experiments on optics. And he had this glass prism uh, in the shape of, a, of an upside down pyramid and a ray of light coming in from the window and going through the prism and, and being projected on the opposite wall and fragmented in this rainbow. Now, this is the first time that color is actually seen as something that resides in light rather than on things. And this is, was truly revolutionary at the era, for, in, at the time, for a number of reasons. First of all, colour is now is sort of a continuous gradient. There's no clear demarcation. Therefore, that means that there could be many more colours than was thought possible until then. And it also, metaphysically, you sort of um, you fragment matter in a way. And so what was white now becomes full of, of colour. Also, another really important uh, mental shift is that the, this sort of rainbow of colours, uh, which is ethereal, it's not made of pigments, doesn't have black or white in it. So for the first time, a list of colour doesn't have black or white. White is pure light and black is absence of light, but they're not within this list of colours. So a huge, really revolutionary way of looking at colour. So. This is what happens. This, what we see, is the visible, what is called the visible light spectrum. So the electromagnetic spectrum, as far as I understand it, because I am no scientist at all, but as far as I understand it, is basically the energy that comes from the sun is what keeps us alive, and it's made of. Um, it, there, there are a lot of uh, rays and parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that we don't see at all. That's why it's called spectrum, which in Latin means ghost, so something that you can't see. The only visible part is the visible light spectrum, and that's where colour resides. And it's tiny, and it goes from red to violet, but there's no white and no black. So, colour does not exist without light. No light means no colour. That, that is, you could argue, is the same on and off uh, the web. So, 
fast forward from Newton's experiments to the web, and this is exactly, we're basically on the web, we're using a Newtonian, uh, the Newtonian color model, where white is the sum of all colors and black is the absence of light. So uh, we, we use the RGB color model where red, green, and blue are the uh, primaries, and when and it's called additive color, because when the three rays are overlap, you get white. And when there's uh, no light, then you get black. It's as simple as that, exactly Newton's uh, color model. Now, in the real life, things are very different. And color is called subtractive because when all colors overlap, and now it depends, there's um, various models. Uh, we won't get into the complications of how many colors, but uh, when colors overlap, they form black. And in the real world, uh, color, the color that we see depends on a number of factors. It's uh, color bouncing off the surface, it's being reflected, it's being scattered. It also depends on, obviously, on lighting conditions on, and on other environmental uh, factors. So it's very different. But it still depends on light because it's only thanks to light that we can see color. Now, this is the red, yellow, and blue color model, which is what's used in uh, art theory. And when the colors overlap, you can see very clearly that, uh, that uh, black is the result. And the primaries are red, yellow, and blue. Again, additive color, red, green, and blue. And when they overlap, the result is very different. Now, the RGB gamut comprises nearly 17 million colors. And actually, it's almost was spoiled for choice, literally, because the human eye can only um, identify about 7 million of them, and some of us don't even get there. So it's almost, almost wasted on us that we've got this ama these amazing monitors that can show uh, the full range. Now, fast, uh, back again to uh, Newton, he was also the first one that thought of taking uh, these rainbow of colors and flattening it and uh, turning it into a wheel. He also realized that in order to get more colors, you need to overlap various uh, prisms, because otherwise, for instance, the magenta doesn't come out straight away. But the important thing about creating a wheel out of the colors was that you would finally be able to see relationships between colors and create, start reasoning about it. So it, it, it was sort of the beginning of color theory. However, something really important really needed to happen, still needed to happen, which is Johann Goethe, who's a German, I, my apologies to any German in the room because I, I don't know how to pronounce his name correctly, but apart from that. So he was a um, romantic writer who started writing about colors, um, color, and he wrote two very important treaties and sort of ended up completely devoting his life to it. And he kind of took the opposite stance to Newton because he argued that Newton's vision didn't really apply to real life because apart from when light goes through a prism, that's not how we see color. There's no practical application. You need to fast forward to monitors and screens and the internet to, to have a practical application in real life. So he also argued that Newton didn't take into consideration how uh, other factors influence the way humans see color. And that was quite revolutionary as well. It wasn't anything that people had thought about yet. He also argued that white and black are not simply uh, for light or no, or no light. He argued that colors don't stop existing in darkness. So he also he created the color wheel as well, but he was the first to actually create relationships between colors and, for instance, say that opposite colors attract, which is the complementary colors, and so on. And this, uh, we're getting closer to color theory as we know it and to uh, color science as well, although he wasn't quite a scientist because he was a romantic. But this is a contemporary uh, painter called Otto Runge who uh, built these spheres and color models that did take shade into, and, and light into consideration to reiterate the fact that actually colors don't cease to exist in, in, um, in darkness or in light. This doesn't take brightness, for instance, or saturation into consideration, but it, it's a step forward to considering color as a phenomenon rather than uh, just a physical, uh, the physical, the, the light spectrum. So fast forward a few centuries, a couple of centuries at least, 
to the color wheel as we know it, and you'll find it, you see the 12 uh, colors wheel that uh, come to us, uh, so many other artists and theorists have uh, uh, developed different versions of the color wheel, like Christmas Itten, Alves, and others. And, uh, however, I am not going to suggest that you use the color wheel to create your palette. Why? Because the color wheel and color harmony are actually, it's, uh, it's incredibly complex. Unless you are an expert on color or aspire to be, it's not really the ideal thing to do if you want to create a good UI for your website. Why? Because there's no guarantee that uh, your, the hues will help you. Because if you look at the color wheel, these are simply colors. It doesn't take anything else into consideration. And uh, most forms of color blindness actually have to do with hue, that is to say color, and we'll see how that works in a little while. Now, the, the really important thing to know about the color wheel, the one thing that, you, that we need to remember is that uh, it's, it's about complementary colors. So complementary colors, colors sit opposite one another on the wheel, and while they're very pleasing to the eye because like opposites they attract, but they also repel. Because there's one situation where you should never use complementary color colors, and that's in text uh, color uh, combinations. Text color schemes just don't use, uh, I mean, they vibrate to me. I just, I also have, I'm astigmatic, and I have another uh, small aim, a vision aim, and that means that to me that vibrates like how it's kind of. Look, and this is the worst one of all. This is terrible, because also, the, one of the most uh, common color blindness issues means that uh, sufferers can't really have problems telling red and green apart. So this would be, wouldn't be legible. And also, in this particular combination, something that happens a lot, so if you stare at this now, stare at it, and then look somewhere lighter, look there, you see a phantom image of that, but you see it very strongly because it's an image that vibrates so much. Well, that's obvious to us now, but it wasn't at the time of Goethe, who uh, observed, was the first to observe this phenomenon when he was uh, in a cafe and saw this woman with this really uh, uh, strong red dress and with a really strong color contrast. And he looked on, at the wall next to her and he saw this sort of phantom image. And it was the first time that this was noticed. And it's incredibly important because he was the first to observe that actually the mind produces colors that don't necessarily exist in real life. And this was also a revolutionary observation. This is called a posthumous color. And if you look at the complementary and the posthumous colors uh, wheel, you see that the posthumous color is kind of a um, paler version of the complementary color. So with red, we have this sort of paler green and, and so on. But the most important thing that Goethe also did other experiments, like for instance, a candle in the sunset. He was saying that the shadow looks blue, even if effectively it isn't blue. So the important point was that the mind can make up colors that are not there, and that we interpret color due, uh, in a different way according to a number of, of almost unpredictable factors. They're physiological, they're physical, they're environmental, they're cultural as well. So basically, color is an opinion. That's it. And how, because we can't predict the variables. Now, is this blue or gold? I'm asking. Okay, who's for blue? It's actually quite shocking to me that, that there are so many people who are actually for gold. Can I see the hands up for gold? Yeah, quite a few. I mean, to me, that is so blue. There's no, there's no question. But the point is that if you don't see it as blue, then you don't see it as blue. Then another one is, is this one. What color is that? Brown. I mean, to me, that's black and brown. Black and brown. Blue? That's, that's extraordinary. Anyone see it as white? I've had a lot of whites before. People have seen their logo in blue. So to me, that's extraordinary. To me, I don't actually know 
Uh, I know, for, for instance, for the blue dress, I know for a fact that, that that dress is blue. That's a fact, we know that. In the case of this jacket, uh, I don't know. But that's a fact because it's, there is a blue dress and that, what, that's the one that was photographed. But it's, it, it, I know we live in a post-fact era, but this uh, I think, is true. <laughs> so, uh, for this, in this case, I don't know. In this case, I do know. So what, what is it? Is this pink or gray? But who's for pink? Yes. Yeah. And gray, the rest are gray. There's, there's quite a lot of grays. Okay. To me, this is, without a doubt, it's pink and white. What I know is that because I'm also a photographer, I've played with color all my life. I know that my mind is equipped to filter out the bad lighting, the, the rubbish lens. So I can see the pink because I filter everything out. But in spite of that, because and in fact we know again this, that in real life this is actually pink. But uh, I was challenged to go by the grey brigade to go into Photoshop and check with the uh, with the color picker. It's grey. It's absolutely grey. So I was gobsmacked. I was like, you mean I'm wrong? So uh, this is grey. But basically, this confirms that. You know, my color vision is as valid as yours, and more importantly, yours is as valid as mine. There's no right or wrong. If you see gold, I can't tell you, no, you must see blue, because you see gold, that's it. And you know, and even in a case that what's really interesting to me, that even we have, we are seeing it in exactly, under the, exactly the same conditions. We're seeing the same thing. It's not as if we're, a, you know, in a different room, or a di no, it's exactly the same conditions. And yet, we can't agree on what color is what, we don't need to agree. I have to accept that you see gold and I see blue and you see grey and I see pink. That's fine. Absolutely fine. But that's because there is no absolute colour truth, then colour can be chosen on a whim. And we must make sure that colours are accessible and that's why you cannot rely on hue. Because as we were saying, colour blindness depends on you and hue and not other factors. So Many people don't even know actually that they, they're suffering for, from a form of color blindness. In my family, we found out that my brother, when we, you know, he, he was going to a wedding and he was desperate to wear a tie that looked horrendous with his suit because he was convinced that that was a, a red tie. We're like, it's not red. So he, he, you don't, a lot of people don't even know. And 8% of men is a very high percentage. It's not, you know, it's not to be ignored. And 0.5% of women, because usually women uh, carry the gene, but don't suffer from it. It's quite rare that they carry it and suffer from it. So there's no need to uh, remember or know what the different types of color blindness do, because luckily these days on the web we have loads of different um, tools that we can use that really help with that. So there are techniques that you can follow and use to create a, a safe color palette for your UI. And that's why you should rely on color harmony and on the group, because that is based completely on hue. So if we look at the HSB system, which means hue, saturation, and brightness, this is where we can find the way. So hue is simply another name for color. Hue is the color of the rainbow. That's what, so pink is a hue, and exactly the same as color. Saturation, is the intensity of that color. Sometimes it's called purity, but I don't like that so much because if you say that a color is impure, you're kind of implying you put something to it to make it impure, whereas it just means that it's less rich. And brightness is the amount of light that is in a color. And to me, that's the most important and the most interesting way, uh, quality of color that we uh, must look at. So, Hue, as we were saying, is color of the rainbow. It's simply the position of that color on the wheel because the wheel uh, is a circle. So you can position colors on the wheel, and that's really, really helpful because you you always, if you sort of keep a mental picture of that, you're always going to know that uh, zero is red and 90 is yellow and 180 is, is green and so on. So I won't do, go too deep into the system because it's actually a three-dimensional system. But here we're seeing it uh, flattened out. So, for instance, again, I'm going to say it again, there are huge, just so that we're clear that that's the most important thing to, to bear in mind. Now, in the color picker, this is a green color. Well, I see it as green. God knows what you see it as, but to me, that's a teal color. And it works because if you look at the position of the hue, that's 176 degrees. So it works with what we just saw. 
and it's 100% saturation and 50% brightness. This is a Photoshop color picker, but any color picker will do. And we're ignoring what happens on the right because those value lab and CM are kind of relevant to us. We're all interested on, on the left. And as I'm sure you all know, um, our, uh, RGB is the representation of the strength of the, of the rays, and uh, hexadecimal 008078 is exactly the same color expressed in a different way. Now, how can we build a palette based on this? Now, if we take the saturation down, it's already a palette of sorts, but it's not a very differentiated one, and it can be quite bland and monotone. So basically, 100% is the color, a fully rich color, and 10% is very close to gray. Now, this is saturation palette, and it's, you can use that, and you, you would know that people can tell the difference between the colors, but it's a bit bland and a bit boring. If you look at brightness, on the other hand, this starts to be something that you know you can really tell the difference quite uh, strongly. And brightness is interesting because in uh, zero brightness is always black. That's in the presence or absence of any hue, any saturation. That's it's always that's always the same result. But if you do have a color, then 100% brightness is a very, that very bright version of that color. Where there's no hue, no saturation, 100% brightness is pure light. To, and to me, that's, that's a really, um, the, the, it's sort of a two-dimensional way of looking at it, and, and I really like it. So that's why also you should always, when you, if you're a designer, you, you hear it said many times, that you should always design in, in, uh, in uh, grayscale first, and this is why. So, for instance, if you wanted to create a valid UI from that green color that we saw, this is it. You can have a really bright version at 80% and the original one, and then a much darker version. And you can really stand rest assured that this is going to be visible to everyone. If a client comes to you with a, you know, a really um, wild color palette, you, this is an argument that you can make to them. You can say, look, it's really risky to do that because there's no guarantee that your uh, visitors, your users will be able to see that. Not only that, but also you can remind them that if you look at really big websites or really big brands, or Facebook, LinkedIn, or really big brands, they really only ever use one color because that's a safe way to go about it. You can var um, vary the hue a little bit, but you don't really need to because look at the difference. The hue hasn't shifted a degree. And yet, these are, we perceive them as very different colors, but in fact, it's exactly the same hue. These are various tools that you can use to, uh, to help with color blindness. Now, Enchroma.com is simply a website that sells color, correction, color blindness correction glasses, but it has a test. So if you've never tested yourself, go and test yourself. It's fun, and it's, uh, it might you know, give you surprise. you need surprises, you, know, you never know. And then coolers.co is a wonderful uh, tool to create palettes that does a little bit of everything. I, um, I don't know whether you've used it or know it, but I, I absolutely love it because you can, you're able to create palettes, lock them, and then save them. I have so many saved uh, over there. And then it has all the tools that you need to check everything and to create uh, new palettes. Like for instance, here you can play just by Clicking a button, you can play with tints and shades, which is a little bit different than just playing with brightness because when you uh, tint in the real world, a tint is a color when you add white to it, let's say in art, and a shade is when you add black to it. Now on the web, it's a little bit different because these colors, as you see, they have, as you see them, they, the, the, the hue doesn't change. What changes is the brightness, but also a little bit of a saturation, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to sort of replicate. But you could already have a valid palette from this. And then you can also uh, use the, the tool, if you want to do it manually, you can use the tool within, within coolers. And also a really good a valid point to make about color of the web is also that you should always take the saturation down a little bit, because uh, a very saturated colors like the ones that we saw earlier when uh, we were looking at the text combinations of complementary colors, they tend to vibrate a lot on monitors. So it's always safe to go a little bit down with 
saturation. So you get everything there and you can test for the various types of color blindness. So you don't need to actually know which, um, what everyone, each one does because you can test it out. Topco.com, you can just um, put in your web page and test it with a filter. So again, super helpful. It doesn't have everything, but it's, it's very helpful. And then there's a Chrome extension that's called Colorblind Dalton, and you can use that and you can check any web page for colorblindness issues. And Colorable as well, which is a, a very, very, very important point that we haven't had time to quite go over, but it's uh, testing your text uh, background colors for uh, accessibility. There's many websites that, that do this. This is, at the moment, is my favorite one. I might change my mind in the future, but it's very easy to use, and it takes everything into consideration. It tells you uh, of what scale of web standards uh, it is, and for instance, you can also, you hear often that you shouldn't really have uh, bright text against a dark background, but that's according, that's for, uh, I'm, I'm not, an full-blown accessibility expert. I'm sure there's people in the room that know much more of, of, about it than me. But while um, white and black is bad for certain types of people, for others it's better. So it's kind of, it's, it's a little bit of a minefield, but this, these tools are uh, very, very helpful to work out whether you're being, you know, at least safe and within reason. So, an accessible web is a better web, do your best, at least follow these sort of basic best practice rules so that your colors are accessible. And this is it. <laughs> Are you open to some questions from the floor? I would be delighted. Okay, any questions, please? Maybe at the back. At the back. Um, I heard somebody, somebody recently said that yellow and black are not good to use because dyslexic people can't yes. see, or is that true? Well, Yes, it's true to a point. Funny, interestingly enough, at WordCamp London, there was a really great talk on accessibility by a lady who was using black and, and yellow, but her black and her black was a, a dark grey, and her yellow was a not as a, a sort of de, little bit desaturated yellow. We had a long conversation at the end about it, and I corrected all my colours to, according to her. So yes, it's true, but it depends because I had a very you know like full black and almost acid yellow, and that, that vibe is that's bad for, uh, uh, for dyslexia. But she said that it would be all right if it was toned down in the way that she, she did it. So yes. Oh, okay, cool. So that's how it goes, yeah, as far as I know. Yeah. Hi there, great presentation. Thank you very Thank much. You. Um, I'm a cartographer, so map making is very much to do with uh, utilization of color. Absolutely. So I've got a couple of comments and another tip, if I may. Or Please. Question. Um, just on that point about yellow and black, um, it is said to be the highest contrast in terms of perception, even more so yeah. than white and black. Okay, this yeah. This is why you see at places like Heathrow Airport, all the signage is in a, a, a version of yellow and black. And when Gatwick was sold to a, a rival company, they had to find an alternative scheme, so all they did was invert it. So it was back in yellow rather than yellow black. So um, the Sorry. second one was, yeah. So the other one was on um, RGB color gamuts. You said 16.7 million colors, and you're right. Most people can't conceive that number of, of colors. However, we can see beyond RGB. So I don't know if you knew that CMYK, which uses the print model uh, for color, goes beyond RGB, particularly in greens. There are greens that you can do in print that you can't do on the web, on the screen. Okay. This is really interesting because I thought that CMYK was actually only like a million colors that you could... could no, that's information that... It's, it's an infinite color space, but if you look at the green load that comes out of CMYK, it is much bigger than the gamut for RGB. Okay, There's so... There's no pictures on the web to, to, to illustrate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was... I had 
wrong information. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, okay. No, uh, great, because I didn't, I didn't know that. I mean, obviously, I know that, I know, you know, how many clients have come to us saying, oh, this looks like nothing, what it looks like in screen. They're like, yeah. Uh, so, obviously, I know that. That is very different, but I didn't know that, and of course, you can't, there can never be a real equivalent, but I didn't know that it was many more, I thought it was the other way around. The next one was on is in chroma glasses. They, they don't correct color blindness or color vision deficiency. All they do is they shift things around so that things like reds and greens are, are, are can be, uh, there's a differential between them. So okay. it, it doesn't correct well, it, adapt, it adapts it so that things are more. Well, so uh, they are a bit yeah, it's sneaky a, because it's they. It's how they market it, unfortunately. You see yeah, they, they, and that's also valuable. Having like a revelation moment, that's not quite true. I what, did you see the, the, the Revelation Moment video? Uh, I thought it was just Yeah, there's tears, there's, there's everything, there's everything. And well, the tip, a very and good the marketing so, class. Sorry, sorry for my rambling, but uh, the tip no, is, a, is another one called, uh, uh, on a website called Color Oracle, that's color without a U. Yeah. It's colororacle.org. Um, yeah. And it's, um, unlike the tools you mentioned which work within browsers, this one works on a Mac and on a PC. Go on, I use the Windows one, and it's on the system tray. It allows you to change your entire screen momentarily to what it would look like to someone with full protonopia, neutronopia, yeah. and tritonopia. So that's the full uh, red, green, or blue uh, deficiency. And so it will work with any program, no matter what you're using, whether you're in Photoshop or on a web browser, you can see what it would look like. Um, so, um, Amazing. Yeah, so good, good, good talk. Great. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Do we have any more questions or comments for Peter? Jeremy? How much do you argue with the clients if they want to stick to a certain color scheme and you say this will not work for accessibility? Yeah, I, I really argue. I can't, I won't, I won't do it. Because also, it's, there's so much more to choosing a color, which is why, I mean, this talk was thought, because I, I know so many developers that say that I have such huge issues find creating a color palette, and I will no wonder that you do, because a client should come to you with brand colors, so a designer should have created the brand colors. If they haven't, you can't just put orange and blue, uh, and blue together because you like it. It's not, it's not about you, first of all, it is about your users. So I would say, no, you, can't, you just can't do that. You know, I, it hasn't happened yet that they totally don't listen because also I tend to be the one that creates the palette. So it, it's, but it's, it's, a, it's very useful to know because then you can really go in and say, look, you are, you are effectively cutting out a huge portion of the population. If they, you hit them in the wallet and you say, well, your website's not going to work and it's not going to make the sales that you want, then usually usually that, that helps, mm -hmm. but I think it's, so that's why I just, it's so important, I think, to just stick to the one color that you know will work, and maybe use an accent color, but really don't go crazy, it's not, and I'm saying that as I wear the, you know, rainbow necklace, I love color, but it, there needs to be, it can't be just a, a whim or what you, what you like, so yes, I would insist with a client, definitely. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.